This is GIP 15, Lopping's Pictures of Ghosts and Others. And we start out, instead of having a me on camera thing, we're having the whole details of Lopping's Portrait of Eon, the painting we used for our starting and endings. Lopping has always been a favorite artist of mine, and I've collected lots of images of his paintings, and we'll use lots of them in these lectures. Like the rest of my lectures, they will be devoted mainly to the visuals, with my talk only as a kind of accompaniment intended to keep you looking at the screen. Next. First of all, something about the artist. Many of you, I hope, already know him from the major exhibition of his paintings that was shown at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York for three months in the winter of 2009 to 10. It was put together for a showing earlier at the Rietberg Museum in Zurich and later at the Met. Next. Law Ping, seen here in an anonymous portrait we've seen before, showing him as a fisherman. La Ping was born in Yangzhou in 1733 and became the pupil and sometimes ghost painter for the more famous Jin Nung. Not a painter of ghosts, that is, but doing paintings for Jin to sign with his name and sell as his. I use the term ghost painter like people talk about ghost writers, somebody who does writing for somebody else. Anyway. Later on, we'll see Lo Ping's portrait of Jin Nung. Jin Nung died in 1763, and Lo Ping became an independent artist, making his living by selling paintings and doing portraits. He moved to Beijing during his late years and painted portraits there of some of the most famous literary figures of the time. But his most famous portrait was one that was never finished, so that only the draft survives. This is his famous portrait of the poet Yuan Mei, poet and writer, famous 18th century uh, liter literary figure. And the story of that is the one that will properly begin this lecture. It will be a story full of incident and meetings with notable people, a reminiscence that is, that's full of name dropping. Would you believe a real king, a reigning monarch? Ha <laughs> ha, and so on. So on to my name dropping account of how I came to uh, publish this portrait and the rewards that it brought me as a preface to looking at the paintings. Next. As I've often related on other occasions, I spent three months in the winter of 1955 to 56 in Stockholm working uh, for Oswald Schering. This is a photo of him on the right being presented with some kind of award by the King of Sweden at that time. Uh, the King of Sweden, who was Gustav VI, born in 1882, King Gustav reigned only from 1950 until his death in 1973, so he was nearly 70 when he ascended the throne. He didn't really want to be king, and he'd hoped that he would be skipped over with his son succeeding his father. Uh, but some tragedy, my memory is that his son was killed in an airplane crash, forced him to take on the unwelcome job for a time. His real interest was in Chinese archaeology, a field in which Swedish scholars had been especially active, and he had accompanied them on digs in China. During my three-month stay in Stockholm, Boo Gulensfeld, curator and later director of the Museum of Forest and Antiquities there, took me to introduce me to the king. Next, please. The king of Sweden, haha, <laughs> who spent an afternoon showing his collection of early Chinese pieces to this young student and talking with him as a colleague asking his opinion about dating, etc. Fortunately, my training with Max Lohr and my work at the Freer had filled me in enough that I didn't disgrace myself. Well, what has all this to do with the subject of this lecture? Not much, but I couldn't resist putting it in. Back to Seren. I was working with him on finishing his seven-volume work, Chinese Painting, Leading Masters and Principles, which was published in 1956 by the London publisher Lund Humphreys. So when I arrived in London, after leaving Stockholm and traveling around Europe, I looked up the person who edited books on China for Lund Humphreys, that is, the eminent Sinologue Bruno Schindler. And here is a photo of him, fuzzy but all I could find on the web. Talking with Schindler, I learned that he was also editor of the journal Asia Major, and moreover that they planned a special anniversary volume dedicated to the great literateur and translator of Chinese writings, Arthur Whaley, who was still living in London at an advanced age. 
Schindler invited me to write an article for this special volume on some subject related to Whaley's writings. Next. Here is an image of Whaley, alongside one of the special issue of Asia Major dedicated to him, as it eventually came out. I hadn't yet published any scholarly writings, and the possibility of bursting into print in such distinguished company was very appealing. But what could I write about that would relate to Whaley's writings to please him? Next. Whaley had written about and translated a number of important early Chinese writings, such as the Tao Te Ching, rendered by him as the way and its power, along with Zhuangzi and other early philosophers. Most of all, of course, he had published books of translations of Chinese poetry for more than, far more than any other English language writer before him. Uh, his books were, in fact, for many of us, our first introduction to the great poets and poetry of China. But all of these were subjects beyond my competence. Next. Whaley had also, however, published just recently, in 1956, his book on the 18th century poet Yuan Mei, and in that he had translated a famous inscription that Yuan Mei had written on a draft portrait of him that Law Ping had painted of him in 1781. This inscription, in which he told of rejecting the portrait and sending it back to the artist, was included in Yuan Mei's collected literary works and Whaley had found it there and translated it. What he didn't know, and I did know, was that this painting still existed, and I had photographs of it. This image of his book, by the way, is a later reprint, the original, which I still have somewhere, of course didn't have the image of Law Ping's portrait of him on the cover, since Whaley didn't know about that when he published this book. Next. I told you this would be a name-dropping account, and here are two more notables. The great painter-collector-forger Zhang Da Chen, who has been haha, seen and heard about numerous times in these lectures. You can't talk about or study Chinese painting without running up against Zhang Da Chen over and over. And the major scholar Shu Jido Shimada, one of my teachers. During my Fulbright year in Japan, 1953-4, Zhang Da Chen had come to Kyoto to work with the publisher Benri Do on the fourth volume of his Da Feng Tang Mingji or in Japanese, Taifu Do Mei Seki, famous works in the Great Wind Hall, in which he was publishing some of his collection, and I was able to get to know him and spend time with him. He had brought with him, as a gift for Shimada, this very painting, Luo Peng's draft portrait of Yuan Mei, with Yuan Mei's long inscription written at the top. Since it was a work of more scholarly than monetary value, Shimada was able to accept it and it was deposited in the Kyoto National Museum, where it still is. But it was still unpublished, and I got the really brilliant idea of making it the subject of an article for the Whaley Anniversary Volume, presenting it to Whaley as a pictorial footnote, as I called it, to his Yuan Mei book, showing the very painting that he had uh, translated the inscription on. Next. Apart from my dissertation, this was my first real piece of scholarly writing done for publication, and I worked hard on it, also enlisting the help of my good friend Frederick or Fritz Moat, seen at left here, already by then teaching at Princeton, and my old teacher Ed Schaefer, still actively teaching at UC Berkeley. With their help and a lot of reading and various sources and a lot of hard work and thinking, I was able to put together this article, making only a few mistakes. Next. And here at last is the painting itself. It was included in the Rietberg Met exhibition, borrowed from the Kyoto National Museum, with an article that made no mention of Zhang Da Chen or Shimada, or my old article for Arthur Whaley, where it was first published and discussed, all parts of ancient history that younger scholars have pushed into the, for, into the forgotten past. Uh, next. My article, though, was not only a first for me, but also a first serious look at a Law Ping painting in print, as far as I know. It dealt at length with the different forms that the text took. In Yuan Mei's collected works, it is printed as a letter that he sent to the artist, but here it's seen inscribed on the painting, and so forth. I dealt with all these problems or as best I could in my article. My translation of the inscription, based largely on Whaley, reads in part as follows. 
quote, <clears throat> Law Payne painted a portrait of me. At least he himself maintains that it is me, but my family denies that it is, and these two views may seem impossible to reconcile. I, however, laugh and say, The sage has two selves. His unstubborn and selfless self is one self, and the self that differs from this self is another self. I also have two selves. The self that exists in the eyes of my family is one self, and the self which exists in Law Ping's painting is another self, and so on. For uh, I'm not going to quote the whole thing. A long, quasi-philosophical, somewhat facetious argument about his different selves. And then continuing, he writes, Nevertheless, my family continues to insist that it isn't me. If I keep it around the house, someone will inevitably take it for the old man who helps with cooking in the kitchen, or the peddler who comes to the gate with lemonade and tear it up and burn it. Lo Ping, on the other hand, considers that it does resemble me. If I keep it at his place, it will inevitably attract admiration in the hearts of my friends. It will be treasured and admired forever, along with his fascination of ghosts picture and his portraits of Jin Nung and Ding Jing. This will make one of my two selves very happy, and so forth. He runs on at length, and he signs his inscription, and he dates it in correspondence with December 7, 1781. And I go on to quote others writing about the portrait, and I build up my long argument around it. Next, please. Whaley reproduced in his book a different portrait of Yuan Mei, done when he was 50, and there are still others extant, for instance, one by the later artist Fei Dan Xu. These all portray Yuan Mei as a genial old gentleman, not with the grotesque countenance and expressions that Law Ping gives him. It's easy to see in these comparisons why Yuan Mei wasn't pleased with his portrait. It wasn't at all what he had expected when he asked Law Ping to do it. Next. Because I still knew, knew Lo Ping's Ghost Scrolls only by reading about it, it still hadn't been published anywhere to my knowledge, I had to use a fan painting by Lo Ping that Wan Fong had bought recently, representing two ghosts, or what looked like ghosts at least, and I commented that they really looked like people wearing, wearing sheets. And I went on to develop at length the idea that Lo Ping and Yuan Mei belonged to a late period in which people had stopped really believing in ghosts but found it enjoyable to pretend to believe, to tell ghost stories, to paint ghost pictures. I compared it to the Gothic novel in England. I had read some of them by that time, The Mysteries of Udolpho, Wilkie Collins, and the rest, which, I said, inspired pleasurable frissons without being really believed in. That is, they made people shiver with pleasure, but people didn't really believe seriously in the ghosts or all the supernatural things that happened in them. Next, please. This was really a quite sophisticated argument for a young scholar to make, and to expand on in a way that betrayed some understanding of literature. My colleague and friend Joe Levinson thought well enough of it to include it in a collection or anthology of notable scholarly writings on China that he was just then compiling with a colleague for eventual publication. I remember hearing that he was criticized for this, on the grounds that my paper didn't come up to the scholarly standards of the others, and I dimly recall his defense, although not well enough to quote it or summarize it now. Next. On a later visit to London, it must have been after a trip to Lausanne to work with Albert Scura on my Chinese painting book, which appeared in 1960. On a later visit to London, I met again with Bruno Schindler and learned from him that Arthur Whaley had especially enjoyed my article. And on the strength of that news, I was audacious enough to ask Schindler if he could arrange for me to meet Whaley, the famous old Arthur Whaley. And he did, and so there I was one day in London, making my way to, next please, the ordinary-looking apartment building, brick, red brick fronted near the British Museum, where Whaley lived, and had lived for much of his life. He never went to China. Like Ed Schaefer, another who never went, he knew that the China he would see would bear little resemblance to the China that he knew and loved from his long absorption in its literature. Whaley bicycled daily to the British Museum, where he held a post until his retirement. Now he seldom went out. 
So I rang the doorbell, was admitted, went upstairs to his apartment on the first floor by the British terminology, second floor by ours, where he lived with Beryl Buzoeti, a specialist in Asian drama and dance, who was his companion in his late years. Uh, the apartment was unheated, except for a coal stove in the middle of the room. She sat beside it reading, her feet raised to get the warmth, wearing a baggy sweater and one of those old caps with green translucent sunshade protruding in front. I was introduced to her, but we barely talked. Next. Whaley, on the other hand, was full of talk, and we spent a lively afternoon at it. He told me that he had especially enjoyed my article among those in the volume. I praised his 1923 introduction to Chinese painting book as groundbreaking, which it was, but he was very modest about that, playing it down, and so forth. I won't try to recall our conversation uh, completely. We talked about the London 1935-36 exhibition of Chinese art. Whaley already had the perception to say in print that the paintings in it were a disaster, as he called them where all the ceramic people who lacked eyes to see, and I think of Basil Gray and Soam Jennings, to whom I also talked about this, all of them thought that the paintings were great, and early writers on paintings, such as Seren and William Cohn, reproduced these bad ones afterwards as though they were masterworks. As I've said elsewhere, this set back the study in our field by about a generation. Next. Later, talking unguardedly with my old friend Donald Keane, I'd been in Kyoto with him during my Fulbright year and um, in the 1950s, and we, I'd seen him performing in Kyogen, the comic version of the No Dance at the Nonzenji. Anyway, talking with Donald Keane, I mentioned to him how pleased Whaley had been with my article, forgetting that he, too, had a piece in that volume, and he might take it to mean that Whaley had preferred mine. Uh, Keane was a particularly devoted Whaley disciple, and after his death, after Whaley's death, he was one of the main organizers of, next please, this memorial volume of essays about Whaley, titled Madly Singing, Singing in the Mountains. I hadn't known Whaley long enough or well enough myself to be asked to contribute to that, so I didn't. Well, that ends my reminiscence with name dropping. Now on to look at more paintings. But before we turn to more of them by Luo Ping, let me show briefly another image of Yuan Mei. Next. A hand scroll painting survives by two minor artists, a portraitist and a landscapist, whose names don't concern us, portraying a gathering that Yuan Mei and a group of his women students held at the West Lake in Hangzhou in 1792. It allows us to visualize, although the place is different, the gatherings of Yuan Mei and his female students in his Sui Yuan Garden in Yangzhou idealized and overlaid with literary and pictorial resonances, that is. Yuan Mei was notorious in Yangzhou literary circles for teaching women in his own house and garden instead of in the women's homes where they would be properly supervised. Uh, he was suspected of having sexual liaisons with one or another of them. And since his reputation as a gatherer of flowers was not without basis, this may well have been true. Next. The composition of the hand scroll evokes such precedents as the elegant gathering in the Western Garden, in which the 11th century Sudung Po and his friends are seen practicing painting and calligraphy, next, and the orchid pavilion gathering, in which the calligrapher Wang Xijer, seated in the pavilion at one end of the scroll, writes a preface to the poems composed by the other participants, next. Here the women engage in such long-established literati pursuits as fishing, painting a branch of blossoming plum, playing the zither and the flute, inscribing a banana palm leaf, and leaning on a stalk of bamboo. Next. A section of a hand scroll by the late Ming master Li Shi Da, representing the elegant gathering in the Western Garden, shows what the artists of the Yuan Mei scroll were evoking. This is from a hand scroll painting in the Suzhou Museum that I used as a color frontispiece, along with a painting by Du Jin, in my painter's practice book. Next. The women are slightly differentiated in facial type and age, and probably represented 
individual women recognizable to those who knew them, although they look pretty much the same to us now. One of the women is painting a branch of blossoming plum, a very popular subject in Yangzhou at this time. Lao Ping and his teacher Jin Nung both painted them by the hundreds. It's a subject that could be used to carry a diversity of meanings, and could even on occasion be given overtones of sexual affairs. I think of one by Jin Nung in the Freer Gallery, in which the red color, according to Jin Nung's inscription, alludes to the red cosmetics of a new concubine recently acquired by the man that Jin was painting it for. Next, please. And here is Yuan Mei at the age of 76, who sits in the pavilion at the end with paper before him and brush in hand, as if acting out the part of the great calligrapher Wang Shijie, writing out the Wang Ting Sutra at that famous gathering. All these paintings have resonances and concealed meanings that are far beyond anything I can bring out in talking about them, and I make no claim to doing anything more than presenting them visually in good images. So much for that entertaining work, and for Yuan Mei. We return now to Luo Ping to look at more of his paintings. Next. I'll show a few more figure paintings by Luo Ping before we go on to his most famous works, his ghost paintings. I've accumulated slides of these over the decades, many of them unmarked, and carrying images of paintings that I can only dimly remember, and I have no idea who owned them or where they are now. One of these is this painting of the Bodhisattva Guanyin riding on a dragon. Lao Ping works in a variety of styles. It would be difficult or impossible to identify a single Lao Ping figure style. Next, please. This one, representing the goddess of the moon holding a rabbit. Chinese viewers claim to see a rabbit in the moon, as many of you know, is similarly whereabouts unknown, owner unknown. One has to imagine Lao Ping doing these rapidly in large numbers by the hundreds. He must have had models for some of them, and these can be identified by diligent scholars, but he was also extremely inventive. Next, please. Here is one, a painting of a beautiful woman leaning on a branch of a blossoming plum tree, which I once owned myself. Now it's in our Berkeley Art Museum. I remember seeing it at a small dealer's place in Taipei on one of the many rounds of Taipei dealers I made with C.C. Wong in the early 60s. And it was very cheap, and I asked him, is this really by Luo Ping? And Wong said, yes, it's by him. It's the kind of minor painting that he might have done to pay a restaurant bill where he had lunch. Ha <laughs> ha. So I bought it as that. And Julia White and I may put it in our forthcoming exhibition of Meiran, or Beautiful Women Paintings. I don't know of any more finished Luo Ping Meiran paintings, but he probably did them, versatile and prolific as he was. Next. About this one, I remember the collector very well. His name was Inokuma, and he was a big political figure who had been a disciple of the great collector and cabinet minister Yamamoto Tejiro. Inokuma lived in a villa in the hills above the city of Yokaichi, a city that takes pride, or did then, in being the most polluted city in Japan from its chemical factories, whatever. Uh, the collection has now become a museum named Chokaido, after Yamamoto Tejiro's old studio name, and it contains some important paintings, including one ascribed to Li Chung that I showed in one of my lectures. I thought that my slides of this very fine painting were sharp, but these images have somehow gone fuzzy. Lao Ping's picture was copied by Tomioka Tessai in one of his own paintings. I'll talk about it in another lecture. Next. A picture of children playing, probably part of an album. I have no idea where it is. Lao Ping also did paintings in a more traditional or conventional style, and this is one of them. Paintings of children were always popular for obvious reasons, and Lao Ping was devoted to supplying his audience with the kinds of paintings that they wanted. Next. This one, alas, is the side piece to a painting for which I lost the side of the main part, but I remember it well. It was owned by my friend, the artist Chung Shur Fa, who had a large collection of good, although not quite museum-quality, paintings. If they were too good, he would have been obliged to present them to the Shanghai Museum. The main picture to which this is a side piece represented the demon queller Junkwei sitting on a chamber pot, relieving himself. 
One of his demons, seen here holding his nose, hands him a pa paper to wipe his bottom. I suppose the painting is now in the Changshifa Memorial Museum in his old home in Shenzhong. Interested scholars who want to pursue this unusual subject can probably find it there. It was not included in the Rietberg Met exhibition. They probably didn't know about it, or maybe they didn't think that a painting of such a low-class subject belonged in their show. Next. This one, representing an old man seated beneath a banana palm, is in the Museum of Asiatic Art in Zurich. I saw it there when I traveled through Europe after my Fulbright year in Japan. And I had the unpleasant task of telling the curator there, I forget who it was, that it appeared to me to be a copy, uh, a copy of a genuine work that I had seen in Japan that had just been published by Yonezawa, Yonezawa Yoshiho in Koka magazine. I remember that because Yonezawa, seeing the portrait of Eon that I myself had just bought, said he wished he had waited and published that one instead because he liked it better. Next. This is a fine and genuine Lao Ping painting of a Chan or Zen master named Master Tan. It's owned by the Lingdong Temple near Suzhou, and it's kept in the Suzhou Museum where I photographed it. It's reproduced as an illustration to Kim Carlson's essay in the Rietberg Met catalog, but it didn't appear in their show. It may have been unborrowable. She writes about it, and I quote, His early masterpiece, Portrait of Chan Master Tan, now in the Suzhou Museum, bespeaks Law's religious interest as well as his personal ties with the unidentified Hangzhou cleric. As the artist implies in his inscription, Master Tan embodies a blended identity, part contemporary monk, part legendary Chan Buddhist eccentric, the pot-bellied Buddha. This attempt at the human and the divine, perhaps reflecting the artist's belief in reincarnation, would characterize not only his Buddhist figure painting, but also some of his portraits of contemporaries." End quote. So you see how serious research on the paintings can deepen one's visual experience of them, as this passage is just done, far beyond my simple rambling. Next, please. This famous portrait of Lo Ping's teacher, Jin Dong, sleeping in the garden, with his servant boy also napping behind him, this one I'll talk about in a later lecture, when paintings by Jin Dong himself will be combined with some by Luo Ping, especially those from his early period before Jin Dong died in 1763. Next. This isn't a painting by Luo Ping. Realistic as his pictures might be, they aren't this realistic. It's a photo of another good friend, the major scholar of Chinese popular literature, Judith Seitlin. She teaches at the University of Chicago and is married to Wu Hong, also a friend and good guy in my book. Judah sent me this photo at my request with a note saying that it shows her responding to the news that she has received a Guggenheim Fellowship. Hmm. She has written the best stuff I know about Chinese ghost stories, along with Chinese popular literature generally, and she contributed an essay on Lao Feng's ghost scrolls to the Eccentric Visions catalog one that I'll be quoting and depending on and talking about them. Next. Judith Zeitner, in her essay, reproduces and discusses several representations of ghosts and demons in Chinese painting as background, and this is one of them. A hanging scroll representing souls of travelers deceased on the road by an anonymous artist painted around 1460 and kept in a temple in Shanxi province. She makes the important point that the Chinese word gui, translated as ghosts, has much broader meaning than that English word, covering demons, goblins, monsters, and other supernatural beings. Lao Ping had a lot of precedents on which to base his images. Next. This is a leaf from an album that his teacher Jin Nong painted in 1759. It's in the Palace Museum in Beijing. I copied this image of a whole leaf from the Eccentric Images catalog, in which the whole album is reproduced as number seven. It reveals that Jin Dong originated this way of, per of portraying ghosts before Lao Ping took it up six or seven years later in his famous Ghost Scroll. Jin Dong, in his inscription, credits the late Song early Yuan figure painter, Gung Kai, with originating this way of depicting ghosts. 
but no painting by Gongkai of this kind can be seen today, so far as I know. And we can credit Jin Dong with inventing this way of raising ghosts in paintings. Or maybe Jin Dong and Luo Peng, since Jin was already doing ghost paintings for him, that is, making paintings, that is, for Jin Dong to sign as his own in these late years of the older painter's life. And now on to the details that I made from this album long ago. Next. Jin Dong's ghosts are emerging from the heavy leafage of trees, only partly seen, not easy to make out. The effect of their emerging from dark depths is very effective. It appears that Lo Ping, by far the more technically proficient artist, may have taken his basic ideas from Jin Dong. Jin, or Jin and Lo together, may have done other paintings of ghosts that are not preserved or known today, not known to me at least, uh, among Jin Dong's prolific output. But it was Lao Ping who was to become famous for them. Next, please. This figure with a cap and mustache and goatee, looking like a minor official or landlord or some other person of rank and authority, would reappear better drawn in Lao Ping's series. Lao Ping, although himself an inventive and creative master, was not the equal of Jin Dong in that respect. His strengths were ra rather in his sheer technical prowess and versatility. I've written elsewhere about how this anomalous situation in which a highly trained professional artist becomes the disciple of an amateur artist. Next, please. And here is the entirety of Lo Ping's pair of scrolls, ghost scrolls, undated but painted a few years before he set off for Beijing in 1771. The eight individual paintings mounted in them are of different sizes, and must have been done separately, later to be mounted this way for convenience in carrying around and showing to people, and for collecting colophones or inscriptions by people to whom Lo Ping showed them. Um, these colophones themselves, some 160 of them, written by some of the leading literati of the time, make up a huge literature that some scholars have worked on, especially those scholars who don't care or don't want know how to look at paintings as I will do. Lo Ping took these paintings with him when he moved to Beijing, hoping to attract major patronage there. He would show the paintings to people and ask them to add inscription to them. His reputation as a painter eventually came to depend largely on these paintings. He enhanced it with his own ghost stories, and by telling people that he had a special kind of eyesight that permitted him to see ghosts in broad daylight. Backing up that claim was the fact that his eyes were of an unusual yellowish color. Next, please. Here at last is the first leaf in images from the original slides that I made decades ago. I can't remember who it was who arranged for me to photograph them, but I went to the bank of Canton in Hong Kong, where they were kept in a vault, and the scrolls were brought out and put on a table where I was permitted to photograph them. This was a long time before they had been generally published and made widely known, much less included in a public exhibition. And my images excited a lot of attention as I showed them in later, later ill-informed lectures. I didn't really know much about the scrolls. I just showed the pictures. Uh, in this one, a distressful-looking ghost in the upper left uh, looks down at a more self-confident one in the lower right, who appears as if he's potting some kind of mischief. Next. Seen closer up, the scheming ghost is seen to be shaped and articulated like a human, and depicted as that with great skill and ease, reflecting the technical assurance that Lo Ping had acquired through his many years of representing people, catching their character and moods and their faces and their, their postures. Next. Two ghosts appear in the second leaf, one of them walking forward with his hands raised in front of him, the other standing below wearing a hat, holding his stomach, looking less comfortable. In both, we see Lo Ping using his uh, paper dampening technique to blur the outlines outward, as if into the surrounding atmosphere. This technique, which must have seemed new and startling to his contemporaries, had already been used, or something close to it, in Liang Kai's great portrait of the poet Li Bo Walking, which I showed and discussed at length in PRV 
Lecture 11D, the one on Liang Kai, and I showed lots of details close up showing exactly how that particular device was used by which the line seemed sort of shade outward into space. But that painting and most of the rest of the unconventional Chan Buddhist paintings that scorned the literati conventions for what was allowable in painting, most of that was off in Japan and not easily to be seen. So that Law Ping's technique must have looked new and eye-boggling to his contemporaries. Someone else will have to trace whether and how this technique can be followed in work stretching over the five centuries or so between the two paintings. Next, the slimmer figure in lower right who holds a stomach resembles the hungry ghosts who appear in Japanese paintings and presumably in Chinese paintings lost or unknown to me. They were emaciated but with swollen bellies like some of the awful images that one sees today of real people, especially children, surviving but starving in faraway places. Next. The third leaf, as Zeitlin points out, belongs more to the culture of drama, with the amorous pair in upper left looking like figures in a play. The white robed figure with the tall hat below them, Zeitlin tells us, is Wu Chong, the demon of impermanence. I won't try to sum summarize your argument. You should find the eccentric images catalog and read it there. Next. The man of the pair, older than the woman, holds her hand up and looks over her shoulder quizzically. She turns her face slightly toward him. Her expression is not that of the conventional beautiful woman. It's more inward, slightly sinister. We have to imagine a relationship between them different from the usual amorous one of two lovers. Next. The demon below, white-robed, is drawn in blurrier outlines. Here is elsewhere in this series, Ra Ping controls the wetness of his lines and their capacity to suffuse outward to make distinctions such as this. Here, as throughout, we can only imagine how these images struck the people of his time who saw them. They were like no pictures they had known before. Next. The fourth leaf is another painted in blurry lines and represents a kind of dwarf demon with a long staff, carrying what looks like a smaller or child demon wearing a red robe. The smaller demon's legs stick out below, nearly as long as those of the bigger one. The smaller demon wears a look of distress, suggesting that he or it is being held captive by the larger one. I have no idea what is going on here, and none of the writers in the Law Ping catalog comments on this leaf. Next. The figure represented in the fifth leaf, one of the most striking and memorable in the album, is not a ghost, according to Zeitlin, but rather a huge green demon that Law Ping once saw striding through the forest. We have to remember that he was able, he claimed, to see ghosts and demons in broad daylight. I've always thought that this was a female demon, a kind of witch, but evidently I was wrong. Next. The figure holds its right hand up to its left shoulder, as if brushing its long hair off the shoulder as it strides purposefully along. Its facial expression is both sad and malevolent, a demon cursed by bad karma or something uh, to endure a ghastly quasi-life on earth. Like some others of Law Ping's ghost figures, it's emaciated and yet muscular. Next. Its long left arm reaches out to an extreme length, as if steadying the creature as it walks, but also as if reaching for something. Notice how well the hand is drawn. Even minor features such as this reveal Law Ping's mastery of representation and understanding of human or inhuman anatomy. Next. The sixth picture in the series is a scene of pursuit, a dwarf ghost is trying to catch two smaller ghosts. As with the others, the story behind it, if there is one, is unknown, at least to me. But it looks as though it should be part of a narrative, and it challenges the viewer to construct one around what he sees. The next. The pursuing demon has a huge protruding upper cranium, as if hydrocephalic. Some part of Law Ping's invention of unearthly beings must be based on the unfortunate people that he saw around him in the cities. The ghost's facial expression suggests anger and contempt, the desire to do harm. 
neck. One of the pursued ghosts, the one wearing a reddish upper garment, looks back as it runs. Its face is small above the eyes and large and bulbous below, as if swollen around the neck. The other ghost runs frantically with arms and legs outstretched. Its body parts are pale blue-green in color, its hair yellow and standing straight up as if in fright. Both of them are drawn in the wet and blurry line that renders them less than perfectly distinct as ghosts are seen. Next. For the seventh leaf in Law Ping's ghost series, I have only the single image of the whole. My slides of details have somehow been lost. But it serves to convey the depths and the mysteries of this remarkable painting. One demon holds out an umbrella, partly broken, and the frightened faces of two others, one seen through the break and the other above, look back at him. Another demon wearing a cap moves purposefully forward in the lower left, as though leading the way. Zeitlin points out, with reference to this leaf, that the rain the umbrella is meant to shelter them from is in fact produced by the demons themselves, which are creatures of dampness as well as darkness. It's like, she adds in a literary touch, it's like Alice in Wonderland nearly drowning in a pool of her own tears. Ah, good. The ink washes that surround the demons and the edges of clouds above them effectively create a dark and drizzly space through which they move. It's striking that a small picture can conjure up so much. Next. The eighth and last leaf of Law Ping's album takes us out into what appears more like the real world, with trees, rockeries, and long grass, except that instead of people, it's populated by two skeletons, one leaning back against a rock wall, the other in front of it, bending over as if in obeisance, one foot raised onto a low rock. One would have to read the many inscriptions written on this scroll, as I haven't, to get some idea of how Chinese viewers of Law Ping's time interpreted this picture, what kind of quasi-narrative they read into it. Next. Surely the skeletons represent the spirits of the dead, one somehow striking a pose of authority, the other one of subservience. One thinks back to the skeleton puppet master in the mysterious painting by the Southern Song Academy master Li Song. But it took a 20th century Westerner to find Law Ping's real source for his two skeletal figures. Next. It was Jonathan Hay, whom I have shown and talked about in other lectures, so I won't show him again. In an article he published in the journal Res, Anthropology and Aesthetic, number 39 for 1999, who revealed Law Ping's real source, an illustration in Andreas Vesalius's 1543 book with a Latin name meaning something like how the human body is put together. A copy of that book must have been in China for Law Ping to see, perhaps brought by the Jesuits, like uh, the, uh, quite a few other European books, but in any case accessible to Law Ping, who ingeniously copied the two skeleton figures, which Vesalius had presented in different postures so as to reveal more of the skeletal structure, as if they were taking part in some narrative situation. And that revelation brings to an end our consideration of this famous series by Lo Ping. Next. The other extant version of Lo Ping's ghost paintings, a hand scroll that he painted in 1797, is a far lesser work, perhaps one of a number that he did in response to popular demand. This one was included in the Eccentric Visions Lo Ping exhibition but neither Zeitner nor the writer of the essay on the ghost paintings has anything to say about it. I took my images of it off the internet from the Facebook offerings of a colleague who photographed it at the Hong Kong Museum of Art, which now owns it. They acquired quite a few years back all the holdings of a major Hong Kong collector named Liu Zhuo Cho, studio name Xu Bai Jai, the Empty White Studio. In my essay, CLP 2000, titled Seeing Paintings in Hong Kong, accessible among the CLPs on my website, I write this about him. Liu Zhao Cho, or Lo Chuk Chu in Cantonese, whose Xu Bai Jai collection, rich in Ming Ching paintings of good quality and firm authenticity, is now in the Hong Kong City Museum, 
He is said to have bought heavily from Huguang Wu, an excellent source. I met him in the late 1960s through the introduction of Huang Baoshi and visited him to see paintings several times after that, sometimes in the company of James Watt, who was always unfailingly helpful in arranging visits to Hong Kong collectors. An especially long and impressive viewing was in 1975 when Howard Rogers was with me. Next. Now back to the painting. This 1797 hand scroll, as you see, sets the images against a ground of swirling clouds and dark depths beyond them, as though one were viewing the apparitional ghosts and demons while moving through a cloudy night. The images are pretty much the same as those in the earlier scrolls, only less carefully drawn, until the end, where, instead of the pair of skeletons taken from Vesalius, Ra Ping gives us, gives us a single skeleton that seems to stride forward, holding an arrow in one upraised hand and an hourglass in the other. No European source for this image has been located, but, as, it, as someone has pointed out, there probably was one, since Ra Ping could scarcely have invented the hourglass. Next. I put beside it, as an example of the kind of thing Ra Ping might have seen, but a different one, a late 18th century illustration to an English novel, which I pulled off the internet, an article on the Gothic novel. The skeleton holding an arrow and an hourglass looks like it belongs in this company. Next. Ra Ping's inscription at the end of the scroll, written in neat square characters, dedicates the work to one of his patrons, gives the date as the second era of the Jia Qing era, that is 1797, and notes that he is about to go out the gate of the capital. All this needs research and explanation, but I'm not the one to do it. And so ends our pictorial account of Law Ping's ghost paintings and some others by him. Interested viewers can read the final pages of my book, The Painter's Practice, in which these two, Jin Nung and Law Ping, are given some space in relation to my discussion of the practice of ghost painting, the other kind that is, meaning one artist doing a painting to be signed by the other, not the painting of ghosts. Well, you've had all you are going to see of those in this lecture, which now ends with my audible or auditory signature, James Cahill. Thank you.